Welcome to part 7 in the series on the end of the age. Now I'm recording this on the 1st of December 2022 and because we are at a holiday destination and we manage properties in this area we're now heading into our very busiest time of the year and so I'm going to make this episode the last one for this year but Lord willing I want to carry on next year in January uh, and because there's so much more to be said, there are so many prophecies to look at and in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So I do believe that it's very important, especially as we're heading towards these end time events, that we need to be fully informed from the scriptures and understand exactly what the scripture has to say about this very vital subject. Now, in this episode, I want to introduce what I have called the betrothal. Now a betrothal in the Bible times was similar to our modern day engagement. We get engaged to someone and that really means that we're expressing our intention to marry. Whereas a betrothal in the Bible days was a lot more binding. It was actually a legal document. It was very much like a marriage except they would never consummate uh, the marriage. It was a betrothal. It was a commitment, a binding legal commitment to marry. Now, you might remember that Joseph and Mary were betrothed to get married. And so it was of great concern when Mary uh, found that she was pregnant. But of course, the angel Gabriel had told both Joseph and Mary exactly what would happen. But nevertheless, Joseph was so concerned that he sent Mary away to her cousin Elizabeth to stay there during her pregnancy. So a betrothal, if one were to be betrothed and then be unfaithful, it would be like adultery. And so to break a betrothal, they would have to then divorce because it is a legally binding document. So what I want to present is an aspect of the Almighty God as he sets about to become betrothed to a company of people and all that is involved in this great exercise. And I'm sure as we grasp these things, we will get a brand new perspective on the God of Israel and see God in the light that John writes about him. For John says, God is love. Now, where did he get that from? He got that from the Old Testament. And so that's what I'd like to present you in this episode. Going back to the Garden of Eden, as we so often do, when we look at what is presented to us in the first three chapters, we know that it's speaking about creation and how God made both men and women. But when we look at the detail, what I believe we need to understand is that God is introducing himself to us. So while he's describing the fact that he made Adam and Eve, he's also describing himself because he said that he had made man in his own image and likeness, male and female, he made them. So let's look then at chapter 2, just very briefly, just as a um, as an introduction to understand where God is coming from in this whole wonderful question of betrothal. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, what is God saying about himself? We know that God is not alone because we know that there is there are three persons of the Godhead, the Trinity, but we also know that there are millions and millions of angels and spiritual creatures that God has made. So God is not alone, but in the sense of wanting to become a procreator as he made Adam, he is looking for a helper, someone to help him to procreate. So while he's saying this about the man, God is really saying this also about himself. So here we get further confirmation of this and another insight into what God is saying because while he's talking about Adam, let's also hear him talking about himself. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. And then here's the important statement. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, what is God saying about himself? In looking at all the 
living creatures in heaven, in the heavenly realm, the millions of angels, the four living creatures that surround the throne, the cherubim and the seraphim, not one of them was suitable to be a helper to God for the whole process of procreation. He needed someone like himself. And that's why I believe, as he says, he has made man in his own image and likeness, male and female, he made them. So God is really also talking about himself while he's telling us about Adam and Eve. Now remember, God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam and he took a rib out of his side and made a woman and brought the woman to the man. Now let's remember that Adam had named all the animals and that no suitable partner had been found for him. And so this is the response as he sees the woman. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So now he sees a partner that is like himself. So that's really what God is telling us. He's preparing us to tell us that he himself, God, is looking for a partner like himself. And that's really what the whole Bible is about. It's setting us up and preparing us to see God seeking out a suitable partner for himself. As the biblical story unfolds in chapters 4, 5 and then chapter 6 of Genesis, we see the consequences of sin as the whole human race deteriorates to the point where God wipes them out with a flood and saves only Noah's family. And then they try to build a tower to reach the heavenly, to reach the angels uh, and to oppose God. And so God goes down and separates them by dividing their languages. Now straight after that, in chapter 12, God begins his mission to find a suitable partner for himself. And so God makes a covenant with an old couple and a 90-year-old woman who'd been barren all her life produces a child miraculously from her husband who's 100 years old. And from that child, God then develops the nation of Israel. The child was Isaac, obviously, and Isaac had his son Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And they landed up because of a famine in Egypt. And fortunately, Joseph had gone before and he'd now become the second in charge in Egypt. And Joseph was able to provide the best of Egypt for his family in the area of Goshen, which is the Nile Delta. And when Joseph eventually died and the friendly Pharaoh died, some 400 years later, we find that the nation of Israel had grown to such a, a degree that they were now a threat to the Egyptians. And so the Pharaoh turned really nasty and he put them to slavery and made their task extremely difficult. And God saw their crying and their groaning. And so he sent Moses to deliver them. Now, what is important to note is that we know that the Almighty God, who flooded the whole earth uh, not too many years prior to this, was well able to take on the Egyptian army. He could wipe out the Egyptian army with one angel in one night. But it's interesting to see how God approaches the deliverance of the children of Israel. He sends Moses to challenge Pharaoh and more particularly the Egyptian gods. And so we see that God uses plagues one after the other to challenge the Egyptian gods. Now the purpose is to demonstrate his power to the nation of Israel because these people did not know their God. So he was demonstrating how he could deliver them. He was also demonstrating his power to the Egyptians. And what we need to note is this is recorded in scripture for everyone then to know about the power of God and how he is able to deliver. Now what is also important is to note that this is a full dress rehearsal for the end time exodus at the end of the age. Because a lot of these things reoccur in the book of Revelation. Even the plagues are performed by the two witnesses. So we find this whole thing reenacted at the end of the age. So it's very important to pay attention to the detail. Let's have a quick look at the plagues and the way God demonstrated his, his dominance over the gods of Egypt. So as we look at the plagues, we find the very first one, there were 10, but I've included the first one, so making it 11, where Moses 
throws his staff down and it becomes a serpent. And what we find is that the contest is on and the Egyptians then rise to the challenge. They throw their staffs down as well and they become snakes, but Moses' snake swallows them up. Then Moses turned the water to blood and the Egyptian magicians were able to do the same. Then Moses brings about the plague of frogs and the Egyptian magicians were able to do the same. Then when it came to the plague of gnats, the Egyptian magicians were stumped and they could not do this. So the first three they were able to perform with their lying signs and wonders. And we know that at the end of the age, there are going to be lying signs and wonders also performed by the false prophet. So once we get to the plague of gnats, we find that they are stumped. Then we go on to the plague of flies. They couldn't do that. The plague on the livestock, where all the livestock in Egypt died, but those that belonged to the Jews did not. They were protected. Then there's the plague of boils. And the plague of hail, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, and then the final one, the plague of the firstborn. And that's where Pharaoh, who'd hardened his heart up to this point, now crumbles. Now what is also important to note is that while this is Pharaoh, in the end of the age, the Pharaoh is actually the Antichrist. Where God challenges the Antichrist, who will also eventually crumble. So here is the, as I said, the full dress rehearsal for the end time event. So Pharaoh allows the Jews to go and they all move out, not even a dog barked. They had borrowed so much from the Egyptians who willingly gave their silver and their gold and everything that they had to get rid of these Jews because of the plagues. And this is what the Lord said. He said, I will take you to be my people. And in the original, that means to be my personal possession. A very important statement because this is really like taking a wife. And that's really what God is saying. And I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into a land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So the Lord then leads them out through the wilderness. He took them in a particular direction, lest they be tempted to go back to Egypt. So he took them in a roundabout way and led them uh, to the place where they had to cross the Red Sea. Then they found themselves on a beach with the sea in front of them, mountains either side. And when they looked back, they saw to their absolute horror, the Egyptian army coming full blast to annihilate them. And then God in a cloud moved between the Egyptians and the Israelites and protected them. And he told Moses to lift up his staff and the Red Sea opened up with a wall of water on each side. And the children of Israel walked through on dry land. The Egyptians in their determination to kill the Jews went straight into the Red Sea and Moses lifted up his staff again and the Red Sea closed upon them and wiped out the strongest army in the world at that particular time. And it was such a joyous victory that the, all the children of Israel sang the song of Moses, a, a song of great triumph, calling on Yahweh to be their king and their God, giving glory to the Lord. Now, what is also interesting to note is that in the book of Revelation, we're told that all the saints sing the song of Moses, the very same song, but they add an extra verse because they sing also the song of the Lamb. So they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. So all of these things are pointing to the end time events. And then Moses was told by God to lead them to Mount Sinai. Here is a simple sketch just to show the route that Israel took and how that they went through the mountains and they arrived on this beach facing the Red Sea. It was called the Red Sea then, but the Gulf of Aqaba today. And here is a Google Earth photograph of the same spot. You can see the beach where the nation of Israel waited and where the Lord opened the Red Sea and they crossed over into Sinai or the desert of Sinai and they went across to Mount Sinai which is pointed out on the map. So having crossed the Red Sea on dry land Israel were now heading into the Sinai desert and heading towards Mount Sinai but what we can say is that the courtship had begun. God was beginning to manifest and show himself to Israel and what he did was he showed himself first of all as the deliverer 
having delivered them from Egypt. Then he showed that he was able to protect them against the Egyptian army. But then they ran out of water and started to complain and moan. And God then provided them with water. And then they were hungry and they wanted meat. And so God provided them with quails in the evening for meat. And he provided them also with manna. Every single morning there was manna on the ground. So God was showing Israel his mighty power, but his care for them, that he was able to provide for them, even though they were living in this very dry and hostile environment. God was their deliverer, he was their protector, and he was their provider all the way. And this continued for 40 years in the wilderness, where their shoes didn't wear out, their clothing didn't wear out, and God fed them continually for 40 years. So God was definitely wanting to show his love and care for this nation of Israel. And then God commanded Moses to go to this mountain, Mount Sinai. And this is what it says. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of of the mountain. So they were waiting for something to happen at this mountain. God wanted the nation of Israel to come to this mountain for a very, very important reason. And this is what I've called the proposal, because God is now going to address them and make a proposal to them. And this is what he said. He commanded Moses to say this. This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now we need to just note this, that the way in which God delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt was to demonstrate his power and dominance over the gods of Egypt. Now, of course, as I said earlier on, there are so many different ways that God could have delivered the nation of Israel, but he's wanting them to see who he was. He's introducing himself to them and he's showing them that he could deliver them. And then when the Egyptians came after them and tried to catch them at the Red Sea, God then demonstrated how he was able to protect the nation of Israel. So the Lord is calling this to mind to say to them, Remember, this is who I am. So he's, he's presenting himself to the nation of Israel. Then he says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. In the original, he's really saying you will be my unique treasured possession. So this is really a proposal for marriage. This is this is God finding a suitable partner and calling them into a wonderful, intimate relationship with himself. Although the whole earth is mine, he says, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So that's God's amazing and wonderful proposal to this nation of Israel. God had come down on this mountain with lightning and fire and thunder and the sound of trumpets. It was a terrifying demonstration of who God really is. The almighty God, the creator of the universe, now presenting himself almost as if he's getting down on his one knee to offer himself to the nation of Israel and this proposal. And so he is waiting for their response. So here is Israel's response. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So now we've got a proposal and we've got an acceptance. This is a betrothal. And this is now going to become a legally binding covenant between the Almighty God and the nation of Israel. Just a point to note is that where the Lord says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Now let's just recall what the Lord said to Eve after she had sinned. 
To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, in other versions it says, your desire will be towards your husband. So, towards or contrary are both applicable translations. But this is interesting because while the Lord was talking to Eve, he was really also talking to the nation of Israel as his proposed bride, as his potential bride, that they would, because of sin, Israel would have to learn to obey the Lord in everything that he said. And also to bring forth life, new life for the new creation will be a very painful experience. Now, of course, we do know from Israel's long history, the pain and suffering that they have had to bear and will, in fact, in the Great Tribulation, Jacob's trouble, go through the most horrific suffering until eventually resurrection is produced. New creatures come forth. So while this was said to the woman in the garden, it's all applicable to the bigger picture and to the nation of Israel. And in fact, to the church as the whosoever will is joined to this glorious potential bride. Now, in the Middle Eastern betrothal ceremony in Bible times, they had what they called the mikveh. And the mikveh was a ceremonial washing prior to the ceremony of betrothal. So it's very much like a wedding. So the bride would get herself ready and she would wash and prepare herself, uh, get her clothes clean to present herself for the ceremony of betrothal. And so this is exactly what happened. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So God was going to reveal himself and the bride-to-be was going to wash and prepare herself and get ready so that on the third day she may present herself to the potential bridegroom. Now, as I said, the betrothal is a legally binding a covenant or contract and that's exactly what happened at Sinai. God called Moses up into the mountain and with his own finger on tablets of stone he wrote out the contract. It's known in in Hebrew as the ketubah which is the betrothal or the marriage contract and so this is what God said. It's very similar to the vows that we say at a wedding. Forsaking all others we cling to our husband, wife, until death us do part. And so this is what God was saying. This contract, this covenant, this, this agreement that we're entering into is an exclusive relationship because it's so intimate, because it involves so much emotion, because God loves these people and he's wanting them to love him. So it will be exclusive. And this is what he says. You shall have no other gods before me. He then said, you shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. For this reason, you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. So don't stray after any other spiritual experience. I want to be your exclusive partner and God. Then he says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So God is going to tie his name to the nation of Israel, and he says, be careful not to misuse it. This is, this is a very important part of the relationship. And then, just as we do at an engagement or a wedding, we give one another a ring as a symbol of, of the contract and the covenant that we're entering into. God didn't give Israel a ring, but what he did do was he says, here's the betrothal ring. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. So by keeping the Sabbath, that was a symbol that Israel was the exclusive partner of the Almighty God. That was like the ring that we put upon our fingers. And this is very reminiscent of the fact that on the seventh day, God himself rested from all his labor. 
And it's also the promise of the rest that he is going to eventually give to his bride when, when the marriage ceremony takes place and all things are said and done. We will enter in to the eternal peace and rest and glory and bliss with the Lord God Almighty. This is what he's offering uh, to Israel. And of course, through Israel, will also offer to those who come to know the Israeli Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, as someone once said, God so loved the world that he chose Israel. Now, why did he choose Israel? Because through them, he wants to also reach out to the whosoever will to respond to his love and his mercy and his wonderful gift of salvation. Here is another wonderful aspect of this betrothal ceremony, because in a betrothal ceremony, the couple would stand underneath a shelter. And this is what uh, they call the chupa, a canopy. And this is what we're told about this particular ceremony. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. So this cloud and smoke that had covered the mountain formed a canopy over the mountain, over God, the potential bridegroom, and over the potential bride. It sheltered the whole nation of Israel as they stood under this cloud. Now Isaiah picks up this thought, and he's speaking about the end times, and this is what he says. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glowing of flaming fire by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and a hiding place from the storm and rain. So Isaiah had picked up this imagery from Mount Sinai and he's describing it. So the canopy was covering this um, glorious couple of the Almighty God, the nation of Israel, as they entered into this betrothal covenant together. And then Israel acknowledged the obligation that was theirs under this covenant with the Almighty God. Then Moses took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So it was a very powerful, legally binding covenant between God and Israel. Now that's very important in understanding the rest of the Old Testament, how God reacts when Israel goes astray. Then we'll understand because God actually, God is expressing his love. God is really revealing his heart at Mount Sinai and the fact that he really loves Israel and wants them to be his partner through whom he would then procreate and bring forth new creatures for the new creation. So no important covenant like this, the betrothal or a marriage covenant is complete without a reception and a, without feasting. And this is exactly what happened. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and notice this, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and they ate and they drank. So let's note, as it says here, God did not lay his hand on any of them, even though they saw the God of Israel. Now, the scripture tells us that no man can see God and live. Jesus said that no one has seen the Father, 
the only begotten is the only one who has seen him and declared him. So what the nation of Israel was seeing here was actually the Lord Jesus in his glorified form. He, he obviously had not yet come to earth, but here he is as God on Mount Sinai, and he really is the potential bridegroom for Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah. And so here they are seeing him and they're feasting upon the mountain in this great celebration of this glorious and wonderful covenant. So in conclusion, what has this got to do with the end of the age? So let me put it to you like this. Unless we understand God's love for us, for the world and for Israel and how he is going about to prepare himself a partner, even though Israel was constantly unfaithful, God remained faithful to his promises and to his covenants and is faithful to this very day. And he's promising that if we respond to his gift of salvation through the Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will save us and we will become part of this very special kingdom of priests and be his treasured possession. This is the most glorious opportunity that God is offering to us. And if we can understand this, we will see this working out right to the end of the age. Revelation chapter 12 has a tremendous description of this when it speaks about the woman who was with child. And so this is an explanation as to how God was going to go about uh, becoming a father producing children that's really what he's wanting he's wanting us to be his children he's wanting to be our heavenly father so that we can go into the new age the new dispensation the new creation the new heavens and the new earth and be with him as his children obeying him loving him loving the lord our god with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength May the Lord bless us as we ponder these things and as we get an insight into this wonderful God that we serve and his tremendous compassion for mankind and recognize how valuable we are to him. God has gone to so much trouble to get us into a position to receive the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, to be born again and to become his treasured possession, his special child. May God bless you. Amen.